Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Man. Bruh. So listen, to those of you who are unfamiliar with who I am, I'm Willie Moore Jr., Willie Moore Sr., and Flora Moore's only boy. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> and that's what we do, because that's what we, if we say St. Louis, we turn up just like that. They're like, St. Louis, baby, don't get alarmed. That means we like each other. Real talk, good stuff. So family, tonight, I wanna to talk to you about something that honestly is gonna change your life forever. To my young lions, I really want you to pay attention, bro, because I understand that sometimes you feel like the OGs don't understand what you're going through. But I wanna let you know that I do, it's a lot of pressure. Looking on Instagram and Facebook, everybody balling. Like I was just with a lot of the guys that you, that you, you know, kind of look on Instagram and Facebook, a lot of them, they call me for prayer because I'm kind of like the cool Christian to them. I don't mind if they cuss a little bit. I don't mind if they smoke a little bit. Everybody got a pass, but they just don't have to be prisoner to it. If they start moving in the right direction, that Holy Ghost gonna get them, right? So I get an opportunity to hang out with the people that you look up to. And so tonight, I really want you to understand that it's two ways to learn information, mentors or mistakes. On this side of the room, it's been a lot of mistakes that you don't have to make. And so what we're going to do today, we're just going to have some real talk. In fact, let's do this real quick. Fellas, can you put your right hand in the air for me real quick? Just right hand. Cool. And can you go like this real quick? And can you go like this? And then just go, uh. That's your church face. You ain't going to need it today. You ain't going to need that. We're just going to have some real talk. In fact, I love this beautiful Ephesus, but I just want us to kind of think back to maybe we at the basketball court just having conversation after like some full court ball and you really want to sit down because like, man, you know what? I'm tired. Like maybe we just talk about it like maybe we sitting at a place, you know, where they play pool and we just having some conversation. But I really want us to just have some real talk. But let's get to know each other real quick. Any of y'all got kids just real quick? Anybody children? Okay, praise God. Yeah, praise God. Anybody married? Just married? Who been married the longest? Anybody 50 years or more? 50? Make noise. The fellas be like, 50 years, bro. That's you. How many years, man, of God? 40? 51, how many back here? He like 50 something. Two? Like two? 52? Okay, 54? 61. 61. Yeah, y'all make some noise for my brother in the back, man. So, listen. And so I want you to understand that I, I really adore my family. Like, I really love my family. Like, I changed the trophy. My trophy used to be, I want to have a whole lot of money, I want to be able to do this, I have my goals, but I realized the order of God, and it was God, family, then business, right? Because she would get so mad at me because I was grinding, and I'm looking at her like, you don't understand. Like, I'm trying to give you the life, and I'm trying to do this, but I realized that God can do more if I could just be faithful with what he trusted me with, right? So the more, the more I start to love this woman, the more he start opening up doors. And I told you in the beginning of this presentation, I'm from the neighborhood. Ain't no woman never talked to me how my wife talked to me. Sometimes I used to tell her, baby, I have slapped men for less than what you said today. I just wanna let you know. I'm not saying I'm gonna slap you, but ain't no man ever talked to me like this. This is different for me. Praise God, hey, amen, I just keep, I told you, keep your church face away, because we're gonna keep it 100. I wanna introduce you to my family. Can you, can you give me uh, the picture of my family real quick, if you don't mind? Yeah, that's my family right there, man, it's the Moore. Yeah. And so, as you can see, I always wear this hat, right? Because my dad is 86 years young. He adopted me when I was three months old. Right? And so my dad, 86 today, and if you talk to my dad, you say, hey, how's your day? He'd be like, I ain't never had it so good. I was like, what you mean you never had it so good? Man, I'm from Mississippi, man. I was a sharecropper, man. I'm almost the owner of the Home Depot store. You don't understand, man. <laughs> still smooth. I still talk to him every single day. I talk to him at 8 a.m. and I talk to him at 645 every single day of my life. If I don't, it's going to be an issue. 
Man, what's wrong with you, boy? You ain't called me. Something wrong with you? You done went Hollywood on me, right? So I always, keep, keep the picture up if you don't mind. I want to continue to introduce. So I ended up, so, so my dad, he was a sharecropper, 86 years young. My mother is on the side there. She been 35 the last 35 years. Black don't crack and beige don't age. Let's be clear, okay? Black don't crack, beige don't age. But that's my mother. She's from Louisiana. She loved God with all her heart, right? So my, my, my mother, she loved God with all her heart. She just cussed a little bit, okay? <laughs> Y'all don't talk about my mama, though, because I love my mama. But she adopted me when I was three months old. And so I often say in interviews and wherever I go across the country, after God, everything that I am and everything that I ever will be is because of Willie and Flora Moore and the sacrifice they made to adopt a child like me. Yep. 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 That beautiful lady next to me is uh, my beautiful wife. We've been married for 13 years. and. Uh, Y'all clap for everything else. Please clap for that, because it ain't always been the easiest thing, right? But let me tell you a little secret, fellas, 100. Listen, and you put this in your back pocket. This, we ain't even made it to the message yet. This is pre-roll. We're getting to know each other. Everything that you're looking for in business, you're learning at home, okay? Don't clap, don't clap, because we, we, I don't want you to miss this, right? Everything that you need for business, every test that you need to take. Like, you ain't even really gotta go to a whole bunch of classes. Just go home and save your house. Because the truth is, every lesson that I've learned how to be gentle, how to walk in humility, when I come in, I'm talking to tens of thousands of people. My wife don't wanna hear that when I walk in. She want me to get that trash and get my socks up, right? So it's a certain level, it's a certain level of humility. So what I'm challenging you to do, men, and I feel this in my spirit very, very strong, is that please don't forfeit your development because your development is happening at home. Every test that I pass at home, God elevates me to another level and sits me in rooms with people that I'm not qualified to talk to. Don't clap, don't clap, don't clap, fellas. Watch this, watch this. Just a real quick story. I feel like I'm at a family reunion. So me and my wife, we had the biggest blowout I've ever had last year. And I did not say a word. She was like, what's wrong with you? I was like, you know what? This time I'm gonna be extremely gentle. Because I was in Proverbs 15 and one, it said a gentle answer turns away wrath and I'm gonna do my best to be gentle this time. Oh, Jesus. And she was going at me, going at me. And then she came back and she apologized. The next day, no, I don't wanna lie in church, 48 hours later, I got a call from the senators of the United States of America, some senators who are a part of adoption. And they said, Willie, we want to bring you in. Did I change my uniform and try to act like something I wasn't? Nope, I wore a great big old hat, I put my suit on, and I went in there and I realized that that argument that I was in, I felt the same thing on the inside when I was hearing them talk about international adoption instead of talking about domestic adoption. There were 423 kids right up under their nose they weren't talking about. They was talking about Haiti. I was like, what about the dude right there on 8th Street? What about my dude right there in Glen Arden though? Like, what about the kids here? And I felt that same eruption. If I wouldn't have passed that test and showed God that I can pass my test at home, he wouldn't have put me in the room, but I sat there quietly until it was my time to talk. And many of you all are in some prominent positions, fellas, but when you get in there, you turn into an educated fool. It was my turn to either do this, act like I was at the University of Mississippi, or speak to the people who needed to understand that African-American pa parents are not available to these kids, and it was kids right around the corner. I told them I grew up with two sharecroppers, fellas. Two sharecroppers, $18,000 a year, and they gave me an amazing life. But I think it's great that we love international adoption. But Proverbs 15 and 1 said, a gentle answer turns away wrath. So I continue to be more gentle. And I said, listen, we got to do something about the kids right around the corner. And I was extremely gentle because I passed it at home. I passed it there. And now legislation is changing for kids to get in homes a lot faster. What, OK? <laughs> Amen. So what I'm telling you to my married men, man, go on past that test because there's something on the other side that God is trying to develop on the inside of you so he can make sure that he takes your life to a whole nother level. Continue, let me, let me continue to give you, give you, give you my family because I feel like we cousins already, let's be clear. So my 15 year old in the red with all that hair on his head, I used to have hair till he came, okay? <laughs> let's be clear, I used to have a whole lot of hair until he came, but he's 15 years old and he's at that age, but this is my first blood relative. I don't think y'all get this. Many of y'all got cousins, aunties, brothers. Somebody probably came to you be like, mm, you look just like your mama, boy. Boy, you look just like your daddy. Ain't nobody never told me that, because I ain't never met mine. 
In fact, if my mama came down, came down here right now and kissed me on the cheek, I would say, woman, what are you doing? I don't know. Like, I'm married. What are you doing? Because I wouldn't know who she was. If my father came down here, my biological father came down here, I wouldn't know who he was. This is the first person in my life that I've ever known who looks like me, whose lips is made like mine. I mean, like, he's got my bloodline. Can you imagine how much I love this boy? But guess what? Guess what? Guess what? I didn't do it in the order of God. I, she was just a friend. It was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And since we just keeping it real, I just, you know, I ran over there and hit something right quick. I did. And it resulted into a baby. She was a friend. But now my first, first blood relative is by a person that I'm not going to be with. And that's why I want to kind of yield this conversation to my young flying savers. Bro, I know your hormones and everything is going all out of whack and you, you just going crazy. Like you really want to do something, especially if you're looking on Instagram and Facebook. But I want you to understand this, bro. God's order is perfect. God's order is perfect. You are the prize. Bro, the funny thing is, is that it ain't even for me. It wasn't the child support. It wasn't all the, the stuff that I had to go through. The part that hurt me the most is that he's not with me every single day of my life. And you don't want to live with a mortal wound of a child who's not growing up in the structure in which your house is in. Now, don't get me wrong. I wrote the vision and made it plain. I said, God, please let the man that she's going to be with be a man of God. And please make sure that he's a man of God early because if he's not, he gonna see God a whole lot sooner than he wants to. <laughs> Flat out. But then when Mike came, Mike Joy, this is a good man. He was a little older. And he was a structured guy. And he was a man who was a praying man. In fact, he was a little further along in his walk than I was. And I said, God, if this is the man who's going to help raise my son, give me the humility to pray for him. I begin to pray for this man every single day. Like, if he's going to be in my, my, my first blood relative's life, I'm going to pray for him. And I really want you to understand the level of humility that it took to really pray for a man who's going to be in your first blood relative's life. I really want you to get that through your head today, right? I began to pray for him, and the power of God came over to me, came over me, and the Holy Spirit let me know that that would be the man that would be helping me raise my son. She'll make me, she'll make Mike mad. I call Mike myself because I love him so much. I like Mike, man. She tripping, bro. We love you, man. Hey, bro. If you need anything, man, just call me, man. I'm gonna make sure you want me to talk to him, right? Today, Mike and I are like brothers, like brothers. I mean, like, I love Mike Joy. He's a pastor, and if you're ever in the Memphis area, make sure that you go over the tribe of Judah because he's an amazing man of God. In fact, he prophesied over my life before radio came. He said, God is about to elevate your walk. Start working in the area of communication because he's about to take you all around the world. And I feel something keen in my spirit as I talk. I feel something really sweet and keen in my spirit, man of God. He said, uh, it's going to be radio. And he got off the phone. He said, hey, man, I was like, bro, I ain't even checking for no radio. I'm trying to get on TV, right? And uh, two weeks later, I got an audition to go be a part of a radio station. The next thing you know, the Willie Moore Jr. show was birth. And uh, but let me, before you clap, before you clap, if you're in a blended family, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to change his name. Don't call him stepdad. I don't know where we got that from, because it ain't no step bills, there ain't no step meals, there ain't no step issues, there ain't no step practice. I call him the other dad. And you know what he acts like? The other dad. Thank you, dude. Yep. Yep. Then my little middle child, let's talk about Peyton Moe Jr. There go Peyton, I like to brag on my family. Anybody got middle children just keeping it 100? Just. Them middle children, Lord have mercy. I ain't gonna dare call him bad, I'm just gonna say he's busy. Okay, let's just go with busy. But he's my miracle child. To those, I feel in the, in the spirit right now too that men who are expecting babies, sometimes doctors will speak different things over your child's life. 
I remember sitting in that room before Peyton came because her amniotic fluid was a whole lot higher than it was supposed to be. And the doctor walked in with my wife and I as he sits there and he says, Mr. Moore, I just want to tell you the possibilities of what your child could have because of the am amniotic fluid. It, can be fluid. it could be Down syndrome. He could leave with limbs and do this, do this. And my wife was sitting right there. Remind you, this nine years ago, I've been saved now for about 12, but that was about three years in. I said, hey, babe, you got to go up out the room real quick. Me and Doc got to talk. And I looked him in the face and I said, Doc, listen, I honor your education. I honor who you are. I honor and appreciate that you have an amazing opportunity to help people. But that's not the plan God gave me for my baby. And I said, and if, and if you would do me a quick favor, you were to never speak those words over that baby that's in my son, in my wife's belly. When he came in, he had the baby. He said, five fingers, ten fingers, ten, five toes, five, ten, toy. Your God was right. <laughs> and my last child is Prince William Moore. He's three years old. I love him to life. Princeton is my third child. And I tell you what, this little boy is going to be one of the leading people in the whole wide world. God has told me that he's going to have a leadership gift beyond measure. And so the other day, we're sitting at the park, and, and we're kind of getting into what I want to talk to you about, because it's going to change your life forever. And it comes in a story with my three-year-old child, because this three-year-old, he thinks he's nine years old because he gives a chance to chase around his brother. You ask him how old he is, he'd be like, I'm, th I'm nine. I'm like, boy, you're not nine, you're three, okay? And so we ended up going to a local park, and we had a good time. And I had read a story. I forgot one of the prominent pastors, and he was talking about his son on the playground, and my story was synonymous, almost similar to his. I watched my three-year-old chase my nine-year-old all through the park and the playground. He gets on the swing the wrong way. As a dad, I'm like, boy, you're going to scratch your head. Get out from there. Stop it. Wait a minute. And then he starts going up this huge, ladder. He three years old. It's a large slide. And I don't know if you men like love your kids like I love my kids. I'm thinking of all the possibilities of this kid falling down and busting his head. And I'm just like, oh my God. But he up too far, so I don't want to scare him and start hollering. You feel me? I'm like, no, don't start hollering. And so he goes up, he goes up, and he's not even looking. He's just chasing my nine-year-old. He goes up, he goes up, and I just turn my head. I was like, Lord, whatever happened, I just pray in the name of Jesus that he don't, he don't hurt himself in Jesus' name. And so I said a little quick prayer, and I said, you know what? Let me just see what he's going to do. I end up looking. And he finally got to the top of the slide. And that little three-year-old must have looked down and seen how far he was up. You can see him just, go, go. <laughs> and you can see him shaking, and he had a decision. Like, if he goes this way, he drops down. If he goes that way, he has to go back down the ladder. If he goes back down to the slide, he doesn't know the possibility of how that thing goes because now Peyton is gone. He don't even realize that the boy was behind him. But now this three-year-old is on top of this slide with a decision to make. <laughs> And so I want to tell him the decision, but I'm like, boy, you got up there yourself with your little smart self. Can't tell you nothing anyway. The night before, I told him, look, it's time to go to bed. He told me, Daddy, I'm going to go upstairs with my tablet, and I'm going to watch it for a little while, and you got to go take it, okay? <laughs> Who? And so I'm thinking to myself, son, Surely you didn't just say that, so you know what you do to your kids. What did you just say? He said, Daddy, I'm going to go upstairs, I'm going to go to bed, I'm going to take my tablet, I'm going to watch it for a little while, and you're not going to take it, okay? And this is all I'm thinking about is he's up there with this huge dilemma. I'm like, you knew all about the tablet, sir. What you going to do now? So I kind of pretend like I don't see him, and he's kind of trying to make a decision, and he's like going this way, and he's going this way, and... He kind of looked, and he's just like, finally, he tries to lock eyes with me, and I lock eyes with him, finally. And he finally says, Daddy. And I was like, <laughs> Daddy. I was like, yes, son, what's up? He said, help. <laughs> help me. And that's the thing that I want to talk to you about today, fellas. Because many of us are just like my three-year-old son, and it's still a three-year-old boy on the inside of us. Because if we step this way, we could really lose everything. If we go into the unknown, it could spiral us down, and we don't know the possibilities of what that landing looks like. Or we could go down that ladder, but that looks like it may take too long for us to go down just to go back up. And so instead of us 
say, help, we just stay stagnant and depressed. And so today I want to talk to you about something that's near and dear to my heart for every man, 8 to 80, blind, crippled, or crazy. If I had to title this message, I would say, help is healthy. Help is healthy. Help is healthy. Look at your brother. Say, man, bro, help is healthy, bro. Look at you. Just, hey, bro, help is healthy. Bro, help is healthy. Okay, help is healthy. Tony Robbins says this. He says, once we heal the boy, the man will appear. If we heal the boy, the man will appear. Let us pray real quick. God, I thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to men of all ages in this room, specifically the way you want. Lord, I studied and I showed myself approved to your word. But however you want to shift this thing, I got my script, I, I studied this thing, but however you want to shift this room, I'll be obedient to your spirit. Use my mind, use my vocal cords. I bind any demonic attack that would try to stop the plan of action today. For I declare in the name of Jesus that life will never be the same for every person under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Indeed. I keep seeing that three-year-old who was smarter than me. He had the sense to ask for help. And many of you all are sitting in here today ashamed to ask for help. So I've been reading the story of David. So I went through 1 Samuel. Of course, I've read it on numerous occasions, but I was going through 1 Samuel, and then I went through 2 Samuel. To all my brothers in here who are not really like Bible scholars, I'm going to let you know, like the Lord took me to where I am right now. I knew like, twi I knew about 14 strong scriptures. That's all I knew. And, and the Lord was able to use it because I was willing to work with what I had. Like I wasn't trying to be anything that I wasn't. And so I was like, I got about 14 scriptures that I live by. I know seven by heart. And that's about all I know. But I'm not really interested in somebody who can memorize the whole Bible but can't walk out of verse. All right? So I really enjoyed David. It's important to find people in the Bible who kind of like you. Like I looked at Judas, I was like, no, nah, I ain't going to do that. I ain't going to do that. I got too much neighborhood in me to do that. And even honestly, I'm trying to be more and more like Jesus, but it's just something about taking the cross like a boss for somebody else's sins that I ain't really got to, and that's why I serve him, because I couldn't, I don't know if I could do that. But then I found David, and David was really, really cool because he was kind of, you know, not the fact that he was sleeping with women, six, seven different wives. My wife ain't going for that. Let's just be clear. But it was a part about that that said that he was a man after God's own heart. I was like, yeah, that kind of feel like me, right? And so as I was studying David, I started looking at his songs because I, too, am a musician, and I ended up going, it was, it was some little book of Psalms. It was a thing like Psalms 24, and it got to the part that said, open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. And then say, who's the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors. Now, I know what David was talking about because, you know, David was kind of a, a guy, he, like he was after God's own heart. But it's, isn't it something about scripture that sometimes you'll read it, but it don't even speak to you the way it speaks to everybody else? I'm sitting there with the new pressures of a new position, new expectations, Newness brings new momentum, but newness also brings heaviness on you, too. And so I begin to, to read this, and it said, open up the ancient gates. And the only thing I could think about, fellas, was the ancient gates on the inside of me. And when I say ancient gates, I'm talking about things that I may not have gotten over as a young man, things that I just kind of raced over, things that I said I put at the altar, but the truth is I just went past that because at the end of the day, <laughs> I got this. So when it said, open up the ancient gates and let the king of glory in, I was challenged on the inside to look at myself and say, what in my past haven't I looked at, investigated, and let the king of glory take care of it? Let me make it make sense to, to my young flying savers. Any, any of my young flying savers, y'all remember Lil Wayne? He ain't really as hot as he used to be. You remember Lil Wayne? Yes or yes? Yes or yes? 
Yes or yes, cool. So, so Wayne is from New Orleans. He's from the Knife War. Many of my New Orleans people, you understand that the Knife War was, it was it's that deal, it's where it was. But in the, in the Knife War in 1901, the Knife War was a landfill. That's where they put waste, commercial and really like, they put waste, like radioactive waste. That was just a landfill. But in 1951, they decided to shut it down. But they did not dispose of that waste properly. In fact, they just burned it and put some sand on top of it. Then in 1971, they decided that, you know what? What we're going to do is we're going to put some low-income housing on it. We're going to build a 123-room school. And what they decided to do with that 123 school, they put students in it. And it was just a beautiful community. But as we fast forward to about 1978, People start noticing that, man, this trash coming up out of the out of the toilet. They noticed that the radioactive waves in that area were so high, and women were starting to show up with breast cancer just in that area. As they did more tests, they realized that that waste hadn't been properly disposed of. And it kept coming up coming up, although these buildings were beautiful and people could learn in these buildings, it was built on a landfill. So it had to come up. Fellas, what I'm telling you today is that you too look amazing. And I love to see men worship because usually when you worship, you think about what you're going through, you think about what you've been through and you're trusting God for where you're going. However, I want you to understand this that if you don't be real and you don't be honest about the things that you had to endure, you too are a landfill. And sooner or later, that trash is gonna come up in your family. That trash is gonna come up on your job. That trash is gonna come up with your kids. But tonight, I declare in the name of Jesus that it ends here. The landfill is now over. Because guess what? I too was a landfill. I too was a landfill. I'm traveling the country getting kids inspired, inspired about adoption. You can make it. Anything you touch can work and it's good, but I never really looked on the inside of me. It was easy to help over my mess instead of to look at my mess and face my mess. See, it's hard to see the picture when you're the frame. But fellas, listen, what I'm telling you is this, I start to investigate myself. I start saying, Willie Moore Jr., why is it that every single year you're not sleeping with a woman, but you have a new emotional relationship with somebody that you're working with because you are a sucker for a person who really enjoys you. You don't know how to deal with rejection, so you allow somebody else to come in and pat you on the back. When you got a loving wife at home, I showed you all them pictures of my family to tell you that my heart loves my family, but my flesh was acting a dang on fool. Landfill. But fellas, help, help is healthy. Help, help is healthy. I decided to get me some help and I started reading books about kids who had different adoption experiences because I wanted to learn more about myself. And then I started to look at my children, that three-year-old, when he was about one or two years old, my wife could walk in the room and I would literally say, don't walk in the room because he wakes up because he just feels her. I was with my mom for six months. I was a premature kid. I was always in a rush to get out and do what I had to do. <laughs> Flat out. But I was with her for six months. Maybe, just maybe, after I was born, Maybe I was like my two-year-old trying to feel my mama, but she never came. What's the effects of a child who never got a chance to touch his mom? I came to the altar. I gave it to God, but I never investigated. When you start seeing cycles in your life, man, that you get pissed off at the same thing at the same time, every time. You gotta go dig a little deeper. When I seen the pattern of my emotional relationships, I said something is wrong with me, I'm sick, I gotta investigate. It could be, could it be that I needed to heal? That I needed the Lord to send a Hurricane Katrina 
to my landfill to move that thing out of the way. I began to look at that and I got an accountability partner and I erased numbers out of my phone and I set borders for myself that you can't call me after 8 p.m. I don't care what the emergency is. I start taking my wife on the road with me. I start having friends in the room with me. It's like, oh, you can just have a suite by yourself. No, nah, Chuck gonna be right there because at the end of the day, I want somebody there for when my brain go numb. Because help, help is healthy. As I began to do that and start to look, look, at, look at my issue, I realized that I could get healed that I could identify and God could search my heart in such a way that he can show me what's wrong with me and I could open up the ancient gate and let the king of glory in and the Bible says that he's mighty and he's invincible in battle. What I'm telling you today, man of God, is that you're looking at a whole person. You're looking at a man who decided to look at himself. Why do I cry so much? Why am I so sensitive? Why do I hurt the way I do? Why can't I take certain people rejecting me? It's because I was adopted and I felt like my mother, my, my mother rejected me. Because on January 6, 2009, January 6, 2009, that was the day because my wife told me you should maybe go find your mom. They found my mom and on January 6, she told me she does not want to meet you rejected twice by the person who was made to love you first time I ever cussed at God I said God what the hell is going on I'm trying to do the right thing but the wrong thing keep happening and I feel like there's men in the room right now who sometimes stare at God and say, I'm trying to do the right thing, but the wrong thing keep happening. But help is healthy. What game is that? What game is that? Everybody in the room, what game is that? Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Each sport has a position. But in this game, you too have a position. You shut up, my shit. And because help is healthy, I got on my knees on January 6, 2009, and I said, God, I don't understand this, but I've given up a lot for you. And you said that if I gave up this stuff, man, that you were gonna bless me a hundredfold. I don't know a lot of your word, but I do know that, that this hurts, and I just know that you're gonna be a comforter. I don't wanna go back to Black and Miles. I don't even wanna drink the four beers that's in my refrigerator right now. I just, I just want to have a real conversation. I need more help now than I've ever needed in my life. I don't know all your word to put you in remembrance of it, but if you could just give me peace in this situation, that I don't start living reckless again, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Man of God, a peace came over my life that I never felt before in my life. And I was hurt, I was going through pain, I was going through issues. But I got up that day. The reason why I remember the date is because that was the day that I was supposed to start the Young Fly and Save ministry. I, what, I, God was just saying, bring men into your home. And they were on their way. She called at 4.30, they were supposed to be there at 6.00. There was an opportunity for me to call them and say, don't come, I just got the worst news of my life. But we are not privy to, privy to the opportunity to say no to what God called us to do because of our current circumstance. Let me make it make sense to my young flying savers. Bro, you gotta do what you called to do no matter what these haters say, no matter what situations come your way, no matter what people talk about, no matter what they try to put up on you, you gotta do what you called to do. 
I got up, I called them boys, I said, man, come on through. It was four of them, Jermaine and a few other guys. They said, what's wrong with you, bro? I said, I got the worst news of my life. My biological mother doesn't want to meet me. Luke 8, 22. And I went right into the Bible. And they said, hold up, man. You need some, you good? And like a fool, I said, yeah, I'm good. By the power of the Holy Ghost, one man hugged me and I cried like a baby. Because help is help. Now watch this. From that decision, from that decision, moving forward in my calling, although hell was breaking loose, moving forward in your calling, although hell is breaking loose, just move forward. Because if I wouldn't have kept moving forward, fellas, I might not have made it here with you. If I wouldn't have kept moving forward because of my issue, fellas, I might not be on your radio station. If I wouldn't have kept moving forward, I might have lost my family. If I wouldn't have kept moving forward, I might not be the voice of adoption because we will change the adoption system and 114,000 kids next year will have homes because of our efforts. If I wouldn't have kept moving forward, watch this. Man of God, man of God, help, help is healthy. Help is what? Help is what? Help is what? Help is what? That's good. I don't want you to be embarrassed about the help that you need because you need some. Everybody's help is different. Everybody's help is different. Let me make, make it make sense to my spiritual brothers. I love y'all to life. Mark 8, 22. It's a story in the Bible because help is, is healthy. The Bible says that it was a blind man. And so the blind man, Give me, give me this. I want to really make it make sense. I wish I had Chuck here, but he's working. He's working. Y'all bear with me real quick. We ain't got but a, but a few minutes. But I really want this to make sense because it's a lot of brothers. Everybody saved? Who, who saved in here? Make some noise. Yeah. Right. That's good. That's good. I'm glad you're proud about it. Glad you're proud. Can you see me in the back? Yes or yes? I know I'm small. Praise the Lord. Because I want this to, to make real sense. We having real talk. We just at the basketball court. We just at the pool hall having a good time, you know. Then somebody just bring up the Bible. I dare not say this, but you know, when some one person starts feeling good, he's saved and he done actually it. All he can talk about is Jesus, ain't it? You got that one friend be like, man, you need to just stay out the bar, bro, because every time you get one beer in you, you start talking about Jesus the whole time. You just need to go to church and be a deacon, sir. That was me when I kept backsliding. You know, God gonna change my life, man. I'm telling you, bro. I ain't gonna be here long. Jesus is gonna do it, right? So we're in that place. Mark 8, 22. The Bible says that it was a blind man. Still talking about help is healthy. They said he was a blind man. And they said the people took him to go see Jesus. Now, in my hermeneutity, I believe that those people were actually friends because friends will take you to go see Jesus. Let me segue right there. My question is, when you go blind, like the blind man, where your friends take you? Especially to my young flying savers because sometimes we mistake helpers for haters. Mom and dad, excuse me, dad, this ain't for you. I just got to have some real talk with my babies because they the future. You want to go to the NFL. You want to own your own business. You want to go to the NBA. The hater to you is the person who's saying, come on, bro, we ain't finna roll up today. Come on, man, we finna go do this. You're like, man, quit hating. I'm finna blow some. The helper to you is the guy that's like, hey, match my blood. Match me. I got my blunt, match me. You got it all twisted. If you share your vision with somebody and say, bro, I'm going to the NBA, I'm gonna do this, I'm about to do that, a real friend is gonna say, let me set some parameters for you and hold you accountable for what you said you're gonna do. The hater gonna keep giving you stuff every single day to try to deter you from your vision. And I see many of you all, you come 
coming to these Sunday services, you on your phone, you chilling, you doing that. Bro, you ain't even retired your mama yet. You don't get an opportunity to chill until you do that. And I love you to life, but I was different. My daddy was old. He said, listen, you better get an education because I don't know how long I'm going to be here. So I work with a different fire, a different tenacity, a different anxiousness to go after what God called me to do. And so what I'm telling you is this. A lot of people don't know the hell you're going through at home, bruh, bruh. They don't know what you're going through every single day of your life. They can play in class. You go home to nothing. You go home, the refrigerator ain't full. And if that's you, bro, you got to come with a different attitude towards it. Don't take God's word as some fathom thing. He said, I'm more than a conqueror. Guess what I'm going to go do every single day of my life? Conquer. He said, I'm the head and not the tail. Guess what I'm going to go be? The head. He said that I'm the lender and not the borrower. Guess what I'm going to go do? Lend. He said I can go out here and do all of these things, so I took it like that. And so my challenge to you, bro, is don't stop until you retire your mama. She deserved better. Don't stop until you retire your daddy. He deserved better. Don't stop. And through God's word, you ain't got to take no shortcuts. This blind man, his friends took him to go see Jesus with eight minutes left. They said, in my hormonity, this ain't in your Bible. They was like, we're going to take you, your little blind self to go see Jesus, bro. No, you're going. Come on with your blind self. Come go see Jesus. And they was like, Jesus, my dude blind. Do the Jesus thing. Do it. And, and in my hormonity, like it always bothers me when people say, you ain't supposed to entertain in church. Can you imagine how entertaining it is to go see Jesus heal somebody? We finna go see Jesus. He touched somebody blind and they go see. You be like, oh my God, that was some. Did you see what happened? He said, Lazarus, all the Lazaruses woke up. I'm gonna follow him for the rest of my life. Jesus sees him, the Bible says, instead of healing him here because help is healthy, the Bible says he took him outside of the city. Took him outside of the city. Now Jesus being all God and all man at the same time, he could have did it right there, but why would he take him outside of the city? Because the one thing I know about is when you go sometime and you chill in the same place you've been in, people will try to remind you of who you were. And the miracle can't sometimes happen the way it's supposed to. So Jesus takes him outside of the city. And I can just imagine the people who I call friends are probably looking at this amazing presentation saying, how you gonna do it? And Jesus does this, he does this, he's like, Ugh. Spit on the dude, the blind dude. Spit on him. On his face. Now, keeping it 100. Flood up. If that would have been the people from St. Louis, $18,000 media income, Ferguson, Florida, spit on me, they've been like, hey, Jesus, we with you, brother. But you ain't finna spit on Lil Willie, though, like that. You tripping. You are not about to spit on Lil Willie like that. Bro, I know you, Lazarus, all that, but bro. Don't spit on Lil Willie, but these were better people than my friends in St. Louis. The Bible says, Jesus said, you good? What you see? The blind dude didn't do the church thing. In church, this is the moment he's with Jesus. He's had an encounter. And this ain't in the Bible. But this is what church people do when they get a touch from Jesus. Hallelujah, yes, I see it, yes. Hallelujah, yes, woo, woo. And the truth is, you still don't see it, no, clearly. He was in the presence of Jesus and said, man, I know you can do better than that. He said, he said this, he said, I see men, but they look like big old trees walking. Jesus like, wait a minute, what the heck? Let me see. It's a gentleman. He didn't treat you like men who say, you didn't get it right the first time. What's wrong with you? You must have been watching porn last night or something. That's why it's not working. You must have drank last night. How were you speaking to your wife? That wasn't Jesus. He was a gentleman. He simply said, and this time, he touched him. He said, what do you see? 
The man said, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. He seen it clearly. He was smart enough to ask for some help. Help! I see men, but they look like big old trees walking. I'm in the presence of Jesus. I'm not going to pretend like everything is all good if it ain't all good. If there's a second touch for me, I want all of my second touch. And Jesus wasn't mad at him. He just, he just, he spit on the first time, second time he touched him, and he said, I can see clearly this time. But he was smart enough to ask for some help. He had already had an encounter with Jesus. He had already felt Jesus' spit on his face. He had been in the presence of God. He had communed with Jesus because he took him outside of the city. They didn't have no cars like that. So you had to walk with Jesus for a little while as a blind man. Now you can see clearly, but you have been in his presence so long, you know he can do better than what he did the first time and that man wasn't gonna sit there he said help he understood help was healthy and if I'm in the presence of Jesus by God I need all of what is due to me what I'm telling you today uh, family what I'm telling you today men is that right now you're in the presence of Jesus and I know you said yes to him I know that you got a relationship with him but somehow I believe that you look around every single day and you see them bills like big trees walking. You see your family like big trees walking. You see your test in calculus and geometry like big trees walking. You see the issue and the dis-ease, because I feel it in my spirit that many of you are dealing with so many dis-ease in your body. Only you and your wife know. You can't even tell the kids, and you scared as all get out. But I declare in the name of Jesus as I speak to your heart right now, with this second touch, it is today. And you'll go back, and that report will be different. I feel a keen sense of the Holy Spirit in my heart right now to know that you are healed. I don't want to tickle your ears. But if you need help, you need help. Symbolically of the stand that you're about to take in your job. Symbolically of the stand that you're about to take in your family. Symbolically of the, the big step that you're about to take on faith for that new business that God is going to birth through this conference. For that big step that you're going to make because it's going to turn around for every person over there who's been typecast by teachers who walk in and give you a manuscript that that's who you're going to be. Remember this on this side. Repetition changes reputation. You've been doing the right thing. You just got to do it long enough, baby, because in a minute, they're going to laugh right now, but later on, they're going to call you boss, CEO, manager. Some of them going to call you for a loan, but you're going to turn that thing around in Jesus' name. Fellas, if you need help, and you say, God, I need a second encounter. I didn't see it clearly the first time. I'm telling you, God is not bad, mad at you. You don't have to be embarrassed about it. If you're here, I want to pray with you, and we're going to scream out to God, help, and I believe he's going to do it right here at this altar. If that's you, men, don't take no time. Come right here to this altar. Help! 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 My God, my God, help! It's nothing you got to be ashamed of, bro. We need your help, Father. Father, we need your help. We've been through a lot. Release. 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 I know you don't understand why you've gone through so much. 